So this video is going to be on the history of the periodic table as well as a little bit on the reactivity of the different groups. Um, so I really would recommend that you learn the symbols for the first 36 elements. Some of them are straightforward, but these ones are weird, possibly. So please make sure that you can at least name them. Now, this is the who's who for the periodic table. The SEC will put pictures of these gentlemen um, next to question four little questions. And if you can recognize them, it, it may be able to help you. So where do we start? We start with the idea that the Greeks in their togas with their wine and their grapes came up with a periodic table, things that made up everything that they could observe. And it was as simple as air, fire, earth, and water. We have to wait then until the 1600s until we get to this gentleman, Sir Robert Boyle. And he is called the father of chemistry with his great wig. Um, and he defined an element as a substance which cannot be split into something simpler by chemical means. Um, if the SEC asks you to define an element, that is the answer that they are looking for. I would also like you to include the idea that an element is made of one type of atom, just to help your understanding. We then have this gentleman, his name is Humphrey Davy, and he is responsible, though he didn't know it at the time, of discovering elements. So he was passing electricity through different solutions, and he did isolate elements, but he wouldn't have known what they um, were then. So after him, we move on to this gentleman. His name is Doberiner, and he is responsible for generating what are called triads. And the way I remember Doberiner and triads is there are three E's in his name, so three for triads. Now, something that most people that are involved with the history of the periodic table have in common is how they organized their elements. And it's all the same way. So increasing atomic weight, and you need to, to know that and to give that. So what did Doberiner do? Well, he put elements into groups of threes, hence the triads, and he grouped them with semi similar chemical properties. And what was really, really interesting, if we look down here, um, is that if you add up the outer two elements and divide by two in terms of their mass, you get the middle element being halfway between the other two. It unfortunately didn't work for everything because not all elements were um, discovered and he wouldn't have been able to find the, the right data, as it were. Now, this diagram of the periodic table is Doberiner's triads overlaid on top of our periodic table. And in terms of the description that's written up here, he is absolutely correct. They are in groups with similar chemical properties, but we now know that. He didn't know that then. So he had the right, he was on the right idea. The next gentleman is, uh, is called John Newlands, and he came up with what's called the law of octaves. And because he related to music, he wasn't taken seriously. But again, he was um, had the right idea. Okay, so again, he's organizing in terms of atomic weight, really important. And he's arranging them so that their properties repeat every eighth element. Now, it only worked, didn't work for everything. It only worked for the first 20 elements, and it broke down after that. And that has to be because transition metals didn't have their own block. Noble gases were there. So there were issues with John Newland's um, periodic table. We then get to Dmitry Mendeleev. And Dmitry is a Russian scientist. He came up with his idea of a periodic table again as a pure thought experiment. And it's ridiculously clever. This is obviously Dmitry playing Tetris in 1869, as one does, but how he put his periodic table together. So we're going to have a look at this video. Hopefully it'll start Five. at the it's right spot. A periodic table is instantly recognizable. It's not just in every chemistry lab worldwide. It's found on t-shirts, coffee mugs, and shower curtains. But the periodic table isn't just another trendy icon. It's a massive slab of human genius. Up there with the Taj Mahal, the Mona Lisa, and the ice cream sandwich. And the table's creator, Dmitry Mendeleev, is a bona fide science hall of famer. But why? What's so great about him and his table? Is it because he made a comprehensive list of the known elements? 
Nah, you don't earn a spot in Science Valhalla just for making a list. Besides, Mendeleev was far from the first person to do that. Is it because Mendeleev arranged elements with similar properties together? Not really. That had already been done, too. So what was Mendeleev's genius? Let's look at one of the first versions of the periodic table from around 1870. Here we see elements designated by their two-letter symbols arranged in a table. Check out the entry at the third column, fifth row. There's a dash there. From that unassuming placeholder springs the raw brilliance of Mendeleev. That dash is science. By putting that dash there, Dmitri was making a bold statement. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here, y'all haven't discovered this element yet. In the meantime, I'm going to give it a name. It's one step away from aluminum, so we'll call it Eka aluminum. Eka being Sanskrit for one. Nobody's found Eka aluminum yet, so we don't know anything about it, right? Wrong. Based on where it's located, I can tell you all about it. First of all, an atom of Eka aluminum has an atomic weight of 68, about 68 times heavier than a hydrogen atom. When Eka aluminum is isolated, you'll see it's a solid metal at room temperature. It's shiny, it conducts heat really well, it can be flattened into a sheet, stretched into a wire, but its melting point is low, like freakishly low. Oh, and a cubic centimeter of it will weigh six grams. Mendeleev could predict all of these things simply from where the blank spot was and his understanding of how the elements surrounding it behaved. A few years after this prediction, a French guy named Paul Emile Lecoq de Bois Baudrin discovered a new element in ore samples and named it gallium after Gaul, the historical name for France. Gallium is one step away from aluminum on the periodic table. It's Eka aluminum. So were Mendeleev's predictions right? Gallium's atomic weight is 69.72. A cubic centimeter of it weighs 5.9 grams. It's a solid metal at room temperature, but it melts at a paltry 30 degrees Celsius, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. It melts in your mouth, mouth, and in your hand. Not only did Mendeleev completely nail gallium, he predicted other elements that were unknown at the time. Scandium, germanium, rhenium, the element he called ecomanganese is now called technetium. Technetium is so rare, it couldn't be isolated until it was synthesized in a cyclotron in 1937, almost 70 years after Dmitri predicted its existence, 30 years after he died. Dmitri died without a Nobel Prize in 1907, but he wound up receiving a much more exclusive honor. In 1955, scientists at UC Berkeley successfully created 17 atoms of a previously undiscovered element. This element filled an empty spot in the periodic table at number 101 and was officially named Mendelevium in 1963. There have been well over 800 Nobel Prize winners, but only 15 scientists have an element named after them. So the next time you stare at a periodic table, whether it's on the wall of a university classroom or on a $5 coffee mug, Dmitry Mendeleev, the architect of the periodic table, will be staring back. All righty, so Dmitry, what has he done? So the first thing he did, again, like every other scientist involved with developing the periodic table, he's organized them in order of increasing atomic weight. And what he noticed when he did that was that there was chemical properties repeated and he called it periodically so this is where we get the periods from so it is the fact that the properties are repeating as you go across from group one to group eight in period two so all the properties as you go across here they all behave similarly and again in the next row sodium behaves like lithium magnesium behaves like beryllium etc etc the properties repeat periodically. The next thing he did, which was very, very clever compared to all the other scientists, was he left gaps because he reckoned the elements that were around the gap suggested that there was something in here. So you saw that with Eka aluminum. Um, the properties for titanium did not fit in group three, but they did fit in group four, so he's going to put them in group four. Okay, so that was very clever. One thing that he did with that was super clever was he was reversed the order of tellurium and iodine. So that are these two guys down here. 
So as you look at them, the atomic mass, atomic weight is going from 108 to 122 to 115 to 119 to 122. So realistically, iodine at 127 should be in here, in this space, but the properties of iodine worked best with the elements that were in this group. So Dimitri was brave and he said, I am going to put iodine in to group seven and I'm going to put tellurium into group six and I'm happy with that decision. So that was very clever. And because of what he knew and how he had arranged it, he was able to make predictions on what the properties of undiscovered elements were and he was very exact and really close to being very precise with his predictions. The last person before we get to the modern periodic table is this gentleman. His name is Henry Mosley and he discovered number of protons in the nucleus using x-rays. So because of him we are now up we, ha we now have what is called atomic number and the periodic table now makes much more sense. So if you look at tellurium and iodine in terms of their atomic number, tellurium is number 52. So even though it has a bigger atomic mass, iodine is 53. As our periodic table is based on atomic number, the modern periodic table, then this makes total sense. Okay. So, well done, Dmitry Mendeleev. So, modern periodic table as it stands now, you've seen it on a whole load of um, cl school classrooms, but I've seen it with pumpkins, cupcakes, chocolate. It, it exists. And you have to know or be able to explain what are the differences between Mendeleev's periodic table and the modern periodic table. So, the first thing we're going to talk about is how they're arranged. So, Mendeleev does it by atomic weight. The modern periodic table does it by atomic number. The next thing we're going to talk about is the gaps. So Mendeleev's has gaps, our modern periodic table does not. The Dimitri's um, periodic table has no noble gases. We now have a group for noble gases and Dimitri had no transition metal block, but we now do. So these are the differences between the Dimitri's periodic table and the modern. And if they ask about both of them, then you need to say a thing about each periodic table. It's not enough to say, oh, the modern periodic table is based on atomic number. You need to talk about atomic weight also. Okay, so we've done that. This is what our periodic table now looks like. Again, we've said noble gas group over here, and now we have transition metal block in our middle. So in terms of reactivities, you've seen the reactions that we've done here. So we're just going to go through some of the things. Um, valence electrons, so number of electrons uh, an atom has to lose or gain to gain a noble gas structure. So alkali metals have one valence electron to lose. We found out that their reactivity increases as you go down the group. And in terms of their physical properties, even though they're metals, they have a very low density, so they'll float on water and you can cut them easily with the knife. In terms of their chemical properties then, they react with air, this is our MOMO, and they react with violently with water forming alkalis. This is our men wear many hats hopelessly. So you've had practice at this now and you just need to be able to do it. You need to write a word equation for MOMO, so lithium plus oxygen gives you lithium oxide. You need to turn that word equation into a chemical equation. So the first thing you're going to need to do is figure out a formula for this. So we look at our, the elements that we have. Are they complex ions? No, they're not. We do our drop down. So when we do our drop down, oxygen is O2 minus. Can't see it here. So lithium to oxygen is a 2 is to 1 Li2O. We then write our chemical formula and then we do some balancing. Similarly for men wear many hats hopelessly is lithium plus water gives you lithium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. When we are doing this, we need to work out the what is the formula for lithium hydroxide. So hydroxide is a complex ion, negative one, you need to learn it. It's a one is to one ratio, and then we do our balancing. For group two then, let's see what we're seeing. Here I'm working with some lithium metal, very difficult to cut. I've got a piece of sodium here, pretty easy to cut. And you notice when I cut through that, that the 
fresh sodium is very shiny compared to the rest. Let's zoom in real quick and see if we can really get in there. So this side will reflect a lot of light. The other sides are pretty dull. And you'll see that especially with the potassium here. I'm going to go ahead and give this kind of a half cut. So for the potassium, this is the side that's from freshly cut, and you can see the dullness to the other sides compared to that one. So I'm going to go ahead and take those three, and I'm going to add them to water, and we can look at the kind of reactivity of those three alkali metals with water. So here I'm going to take the lithium and add that to the water. It's going to generate hydrogen gas and lithium hydroxide. So you're going to see a pink color develop here, and then you're going to see some smoke come off, and that's either lithium metal or that's lithium hydroxide coming off of there. Maybe a little bit of liquid water. But it's not as reactive as, say, sodium, so I'm going to put sodium into the next one. And the sodium is actually probably going to ignite. So you'll see some orange flame, perhaps, or some sparks, or some shrapnel. And then the last one, I'm going to go ahead and put my two pieces of potassium in that I've cut in half. So this is less potassium than the other two in terms of amount. You'll find that the reactivity is a little bit greater. So what he should have said and he didn't is the fact that um, the pink color is due to an indicator that's proving that you're making a, an alkali in there. So in terms of group two then, what about their valence electrons? So these have two outer electrons that they can lose to get a full outer energy level. Their reactivity, they get more reactive down the group, but they're not as reactive as group one. In terms of their physical properties then, they're harder and they're more denser than your alkali metals, so they will the most part sink when you put them into water. Their chemical properties, they react in the same way. So they will do Momo and they will do Men Wear Many Hats Hopelessly. Exact same thing. So you've had practice again of writing word equations from your magnesium oxide. We're using our drop down method to work out what is our formula for magnesium oxide. So remember that when we do the drop down, if it's a two is to two, it's gonna end up being a one is to one. We write our equation and then we do our balancing. Again, Men wear many hats hopelessly. Metal plus water gives you magnesium hydroxide and hydrogen. The magnesium hydroxide, again, we have to do our drop-down method. You have to know that hydroxide is a complex ion, negative one. And when we do our drop-down, we get an MgOH twice is how we say it, but we put brackets around our complex ion so that we actually have two of these for every one magnesium. And we balance. So this is just showing you group two Brilliant. metals in hot water, in water. Magnesium is not very reactive, but as you go further down, you can see more reactive. They're releasing um, the hydrogen gas, and if there was indicator in there, we would see the base. So group seven halogens, these are weird ones because the reactivity now works the other way. So instead of getting more reactive down the group, they're getting more reactive up the group. In terms of valence electrons, we know group 7 needs to gain one electron to have its full outer energy level. We've just discussed the reactivity. It goes up the group, and the reason it does is because fluorine is a really small. It only has two electron um, energy levels, so the nucleus is really good at sucking um, negative charge toward itself, so that's why our reactivity gets um, increases. When we get to chlorine, chlorine will have three energy levels when we draw Bohr diagrams for it. Um, bromine will have four, and so on as you um, go down your groups. In terms of physical properties, so these ones, they exist in, in all three states of matter. So as you go down the group, they start off as gases, they end up becoming liquids, and then they become solids. So they exist as compounds that have really low melting and boiling points, and they have ones that have really high melting and boiling points. In terms of their chemical properties then, 
the halogens will react with hydrogen to form compounds which are acidic. So hydrogen plus chlorine gives you hydrogen chloride when it's in gas form, but gives you hydrochloric acid when it is in liquid form. So that is a real um, important thing. We will see it in the beginning of form five when we do a diffusion experiment. So HCl as a gas is hydrogen chloride and HCl as a liquid is um, hydrochloric acid. Or uh, sorry, it should actually be aqueous, bad me. And we did see the little demo in lab when we react the halogens with um, group one metals. We make, you make salts. Just the last little bit on the noble gases then. So noble gases are chemically unreactive because they have full outer shells. They're not reactive, but as you go down the group, their boiling point gets bigger. And it essentially has to do at that point with the size of their atoms. So the bigger you are, the more electrons you have. And we will learn about this thing, van der Waals forces, when we get further into our question five content. And the more van der Waals you have, the, the bigger boiling point because these Krypton atoms, say for example, they will all be more attracted to each other because they have this van der Waals. Um, and again, you can say similar things for group ones, group twos, all the way up to group eight. The last thing I'm gonna just leave you with is we're going to get to a stage where we're going to be doing electron configurations and we're gonna use our periodic table to do it, um, but we call different blocks different things. So groups one and groups two are called an S block, groups three to eight are called the P block. Our noble gases are a D block. And the F block is the one that slots in to this position here on your periodic table. So this is just a little introduction to S, P, D, and F. And that brings us to the end of the history of the periodic table.